This program is brought to you by Stanford Hospital and Clinics. Hello, I'm uh, David Lee, and I'd like to welcome you uh, to Stanford Cardiology YouTube. Um, I'm here today with Dr. Ewan Ashley, uh, who is the director of the Cardiomyopathy Center here and uh, has a very strong interest in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, Ewan, tell me a little bit more about what hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and, and what is it exactly? Yeah, well, it's a, a disease of the heart muscle caused by abnormal thickening. Uh, it's in fact a familial disease, so it's caused by an abnormal gene and that gene codes for a protein that is part of the contraction apparatus of the heart muscle. Mm -hmm. And what it can do is cause a uh, buildup of pressure inside the heart so that the blood can't get out. And that can cause symptoms such as chest pain or mm -hmm. shortness of breath. And it can even be associated with dangerous rhythms of the heart mm. and can cause sudden death. And so when you see patients with this, how, how do they get referred to you? Are they self-referred? Uh, how does that happen? Does a doctor send them to yeah, you once so the diagnosis has been made? For the most part, uh, patients will go in and sometimes on routine examination, their doctor will hear a murmur. The buildup mm -hmm. of pressure can be associated with that kind of a sound. Or increasingly now, we're seeing younger patients who have screening tests, so pre-participation mm -hmm. physicals, and uh, they get referred to our, our clinic. Or they have a family history because it runs in families. We often see family members. And, and so when, when should we be worried about... Uh, the sanity. Is it very common? Is it in the population half the people out there, a third? How, how many yeah. people actually have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So it counts as a rare disease, but it's actually the most common cardiovascular rare disease. So it's one in 500 in the population. And that number is really very stable across different populations in different parts of the world, and it's the same across males and females. Mm -hmm. And so if a patient gets referred to you, what should they expect? Should they expect to have a whole bunch of tests done? Do they have poking and prodding that needs to be done? What, what, what actually happens well, We try to you? avoid the poking and prodding. <laughs> okay, possible. good. Yeah. But there's always going to be tests if okay. you're going to see your doctor. Sure. And uh, we do an electrocardiogram, so okay. uh, 12 electrodes are strapped across the test. It's a very basic thing. And then we do imaging of the heart using okay. ultrasound. Uh, or sometimes magnetic resonance imaging increasingly okay. these days. We often do a treadmill test on the patients to look at their heart both at rest and uh, during exercise. And of course, we take a family history, mm -hmm. um, ask them about uh, three generations of their, their pedigree and uh, ask them about their symptoms. Okay. And so. um, let's say they do have symptoms and they need treatment. What are their yeah. options for treatment? Well, we start simple. Uh, all patients, we, talk, we think about medical therapy first. So okay. we're, we're thinking about medications, simple medications like beta blockers um, and calcium channel blockers. We mm -hmm. think of these are agents that try to r sort of relax the heart a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, and then because of the risk of sudden death, a, s a small number of our patients will actually require protection. And we're, mm -hmm. we're lucky now these days that we can offer that in the form of an implantable defibrillator, a small pacemaker-like device that goes just under the collarbone here. Um, and then a population of the patients will have this big buildup of pressure, and that mm -hmm. will be the main cause of their symptoms. And w there's a couple of different things we can offer them in that case. Uh, one is surgery, and the surgery mm -hmm. will uh, come forward to take some of that heart muscle out. So you're talking like open heart surgery, right. to carve, carve out or exactly. take out pieces of the heart muscle? Okay. Yeah, the surgeon actually comes from the top uh, and goes in through the, the valve that lets the blood out of the heart mm -hmm. and takes out a little piece of the heart muscle. Um, and then over the, the last few years, we've uh, become increasingly used to the idea of, of trying to not do open heart surgery where mm -hmm. possible. And there's a technique where we actually uh, inject alcohol into an artery in the mm -hmm. heart to try and mimic the same thing as the surgery. The surgery's been around a bit longer, mm -hmm. but and that the idea then is to reduce the buildup of pressure in the heart. So do you only do these more invasive procedures then if the medications aren't working or the patients can't tolerate the medications, or do you use it as frontline therapy? Yeah, no, that's a great question, and exactly right. We tend to do the simple things first, so we use the medications first, mm -hmm. and then in most cases we're able to control the symptoms and make people feel better. But for those patients in whom that's not enough, then we, we go towards the more invasive options. Okay. So you offer really a full array of treatment options for patients. Yeah. And what, what should they expect? I mean, you know, a lot of people out there probably don't know what hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and then they get a diagnosis. Does this mean that they're going to die earlier than other people would? Or are there certain maybe certain types of patients that who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that might have a greater risk? How, how do you differentiate then? How do you find out more about that. Yeah, that's a really important point. A large number of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will live a normal lifespan mm -hmm. uh, and they'll die of something else. Okay. Um, and this will not affect them. In many cases, our aim is to bring them in and work them up and then have them get on with their life. 
um, and, and get them to a point where them, they have little symptoms so that they can get on and do everything as normal. We do restrict their activity a little bit, or at least we restrict high intensity exercise, but otherwise we want them to have a normal life. But there will, of course, be a smaller number of patients who will require invasive procedures, like we mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a very small percentage of patients who will go on, for example, and may even require a heart transplant. But I'd emphasize that that was a really a small number and small percentage of patients. So, so how many patients do you see, say, do you have a weekly clinic, a monthly clinic? How does that work? Yeah, we have a, a clinic all day on a Thursday at Stanford. We mm -hmm. see patients and we usually see five or six new patients every week. And of course, with every new patient, we, we have a new family. And so we're really looking after their family too. And family screening for this condition is an important part of, of what we do. And we can do that with uh, either ultrasound of the heart and mm -hmm. electrocardiogram or increasingly now with genetic testing. Mm -hmm. And does the genetic testing just help you in terms of also figuring out what the best therapy is for somebody? Or is it just to make, just to so you have a marker maybe to tell you that this person, maybe a person's son or daughter, uh, may have potentially uh, this trait as they right. go on in time. It's in exactly the, yeah. the latter. It's actually the, to, to help us with the family screening, okay. uh, to tell us if, if a family member has a predisposition to the disease. At the moment, we don't make any of our clinical decisions uh, for the patient in front of us based mm -hmm. on the genetic test, but increasingly, uh, it can make a really big difference for families. That's great. And mm -hmm. how, how does someone get in touch with you if they have a family member who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or uh, maybe they suspect that they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or they had, a, uh, again, some reason to get in contact. How would they get in contact with you? Yeah, there's a lot of great information on, on the internet, and, okay. and going to a search engine like Google and typing in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, with Stanford will take you to our website, and you can go directly from there to, to book an appointment with our mm -hmm. clinic. Now, do you, you have a whole team of people, though. I, this is not just you Absolutely. and one nurse. It's actually a whole yeah. whole bunch of people that work with you. And the multidisciplinary aspect of this is very important because mm -hmm. we've already, we've touched on many areas of subspecialties of cardiology and, mm -hmm. and, and surgery even. Mm -hmm. So we work very closely uh, with our interventional team mm -hmm. uh, for the alcohol ablation with the genetics uh, team for doing the genetics with our surgeons and our electrophysiology team, the, the ele electricians of the heart who help yeah. with the defibrillators. And, and what do you think uh, the, the advantages are of coming to a place like Stanford where you have a specific hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic versus staying with your local doctor. And do you, uh, obviously I would expect that you would keep in touch with your local doctors uh, for your patients, but uh, you know, what do you offer that isn't necessarily out there in the community? Yeah, the, lo the local doctor is very important, but the, the fact of the matter is that we probably see as many patients in one day as, as they're going to see with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in, in 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. So we hope to be able to help with things that they don't see every day with the genetic testing, for example. Of course, the surgery is, uh, is a very specialized thing, and the same with the interventional procedure of alcohol ablation. So I think that uh, the, um, in most cases these very specialized interventions are, are, are best done in the big centers uh, and we hope to have good communication with ourselves and with local uh, cardiologists to, to really help the patient in the best way possible. Well, that's great. Well, yeah. this has been Ewan Ashley from the Stanford Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Center. Thanks Ewan for coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.